kind of a reaction after people just saw such an honest film about it. It's delicious ego food. It's a little odd, though, with the lights. I kind of feel like somebody's trying to land a 747. <laughs> also, I don't have any bass and drums, so I don't really know what to do. There's no band. Hi, you guys. Hello. Thank you for coming. So, I want to ask you, like, how did this come about before you come and direct? A movie about about David, about, but a movie that is not sort of the cliche written rock doc that we've seen like a, a zillion times before. Uh, well, I met Crosby when he was 69 years old, and he was in the midst of recording what was his first solo album in 20 years called Cross. And what the music that I heard was totally defied any expectation that I had had. What one would have, you know, your first solo album in 20 years, and it's, it was beautiful, beautiful music. So we became unlikely friends because I was such a fan of what he was doing. And uh, soon after, I said, you know, we should probably shoot some footage of this, <laughs> just for posterity, you know. And he graciously agreed. And um, wait, so, wait, wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> I did not graciously agree. I said, yeah, sure, kid. <laughs> <laughs> he persisted. And then they blew you off the second time. And then you persisted. And I said, okay, I get it. And then he started shooting this really good stuff, and I said, oh, Jesus, I should have said yes sooner. <laughs> <laughs> the minute I started, you know, asking him some questions on camera, and, the, and I was like, you know, Crosby is a damn good rock on tour, and, and uh, we were getting some great stuff. So for a couple of years, I begged and borrowed and pledged to shoot as much footage as I possibly could, and uh, came point to, I had a bunch of bizarre Hollywood meetings, one company, you know, because I needed financing, it was kind of financing as well. And, uh, and one company's like, you know, we'll finance it, but you know, he's kind of a has been. Could we put one of our hip hop artists in there? <laughs> <laughs> and then we could justify it. And I was like, that's never going to happen. No way. No way. And then, so kind of was like, I kind of almost resigned myself that maybe this movie may not get made. And Jill Mazursky, who has been a, a, a big art supporter of this movie since from the beginning, she's our executive producer, one of them. Uh, I went and met with her uh, after one of these bizarre meetings at her office, and in the hallway was the rock and roll music movie oracle, Mr. Cameron Crowe, and I was like, lightning struck my brain. That's it. Cameron, why didn't I think about this sooner? So she advocated uh, for me, and, and Cameron graciously met with me, and I said, you know what, we're doing this, and, and and we, I could immediately, from our first meeting, we were on basically the same wavelength. And, you know, well, but Cameron, you know, the, because of the history that the two of you have, going back to the mid-70s, how did that sort of like make you feel more comfortable about, about being as, as honest as you are in the film? When, when I saw these guys, they, they had like uh, incredibly youthful fire about them. They were just like anxious to make this movie. And we were doing some other stuff, and uh, the idea of interviewing Cross is always a thrill for me. I've been doing it for a while. Yeah, and it's, it's, it, it's one of the most fun interview experiences you will ever get, because he will embellish and, and help your question, go on, go on a story filled with magnificent detail that will have you laughing and crying and all of it. Um, so I just can't help but want to think about what that film would be and, and, and maybe interview him for it, but we weren't really available. So I said, look, let me do one interview for you. And you take it, just put my name on it as interviewer, and, and I just want to sit down with David, let's mic him really warmly and have him looking just almost right into the lens and make you feel like there's no middle man. You know him really well and you can ask him anything. And that, that would be a great way just to give you an interview. Of course, it's quicksand. As soon as we yeah, started, we said, oh, interviews. sure, just one interview, no problem. You know, <laughs> and the tentacles come out of the floor. <laughs> and he would call me and ask me to produce it. And, um, and I'd say, oh, just one more interview. And then one day, it's like, of course we have to do this together. We like each other. We have a similar idea that maybe we can make a film that's a little different than the usual kind of, you know, music documentary. And it can be striking in that he just tells you anything. And so, um, so that, that began us going for deeper waters. And um, I felt I could ask him anything, and 
he, as, as you can see in the course of the film, in the, it's the first interview session where he does the thing about like, I like being scratched behind my ear. He's kind of spartan laden and it's fresh, and it's our first interview. By the end, he's talking on that couch, and he's talking about pain. He's also telling the coal train story. Right. So you can see kind of the flow of how we just got into such a wonderful dialogue. And really, it was plugging in mood and feeling and emotion and archival stuff. And we had so much fun doing it. We're actually kind of still geeking out about the project a little bit. <laughs> um, because he is the most youthful guy I know. Oh, Scott. And uh, <laughs> you'll see as you okay, hear his talk. Don't call I hate it when you get mushy. I really do. <laughs> you know, start, starting off the, what we're talking about culturing. You know, people love what other people are passionate about. And the way you're just describing the jazz, you know, you, you sort of set the tone for the duration of the movie with that first interview because you were just so passionate about the music. And you maintain that passion throughout the course of the, of the film, doing all the interviews. And because you're, you're doing these interviews today, like how did this perspective that you have now make you see things a little differently from maybe 25 years ago? <laughs> Big question. Uh, you know, I, I'm learning as I go along. Let, let me go someplace else in your question. Yeah, I, I, I think you had a valid point, but I, there's a reason we did this. I'm supposed to be, I'm 77 years old, and I'm supposed to be walking up into the sunset going, eh, yeah, it's been great, you know me yet. <laughs> you know, there's a nice folks so I'm being away for a little while, you know? And it, it didn't work out that way. Uh, four albums in four years. Fifth one, half a year. Doesn't make any sense. And the first time, was, you know, pays for records anymore, so there's no sense to do it yet. It's because the music came, because the town of music came. That's where this started. AJ looked and he said, you know, you're supposed to be doing like a Christmas album. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something that signifies the end of your career, most assuredly. <laughs> and, um, and he loves music, and he could tell that it was really good, heartfelt music, and that it was skillfully done, and, and good people were doing it. That's not how the story was supposed to go. Right, so that's what started this. AJ saying, hmm. Uh, because I trust him, it wound up going way deeper than even we meant to go, and we meant to go deep. There isn't any point in doing it any other way. We have seen tons of documentaries that displeased us no end because they were shallow as a bird bath. <laughs> that didn't go in at all. If I want to see a documentary about you, I want, to, I want to know what matters to you. I want to know who you love. I want to know what you're afraid of. I want to know what, what you care about. That's the shit I want to know. Well, that's who they are. They're filmmakers. That's, that's their meat and potatoes. They want to make you care about it, and they will. That's not the level that we had seen in, in most of the documentaries that all of us have seen. And we thought we had an opportunity to do it differently, and we did. And there you are. Did you like it? Yeah. 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 One of the things that I loved about the film, and, and because I was expecting a rock documentary, like I, and I love these rock documentaries because I love that kind of that music, especially that era, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, was the honesty of it. But also, you talk about recording four albums in five years. It was the vitality of your music today, of your life today. And I felt like this was a documentary about your life that is looking forward, not looking behind. Was that like a conscious uh, thing? He, he didn't want to go to Laurel Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps he knows. <laughs> You're right about forward and behind. I am almost completely, entirely looking forward. I don't even listen to CSN, CSN, my records. I'm proud of that stuff. But yeah, my whole focus is on tomorrow, next week, what I want to do this coming year, almost entirely. And you were going to say? Well, um, I don't know if my
the mic's working here. The one thing I can see in these new albums that is made um, is that uh, they are actually kind of more like the past. There's so many lyrics in contained in these, in these albums, especially in, in here if you listen to the very last one, there's lyrics about Christine. And it seemed like those lyrics were, and, and the whole the whole vibe is kind of returning to, it. I thought that Lighthouse, the second of that album, was like, if I can remember my name, too. And you're, you're, you're in touch with the past, so I can see moving forward is also kind of like looking back to the past. It's so it's okay to look back, you just don't want to be stuck there. Yeah. That's basically what it is. You know, the other thing is, you know, the footage, there is so much footage from your life. So how do you take this career, especially one that is, that is using new footage of you in the core studio with your new band, and, and bring it all down to this? This could have been 195 minutes, I would have been perfectly happy. I'm, I'm very unhappy, but they left out all the nude stuff. To get serious for a second, AJ did assemble a really incredible team. We had brilliant editors. They had brilliant editors, not my film. All I do is not lie. They, they had brilliant editors, and they did work in the editing room, all of them with the editors. They, I think they made a good film. Yeah. 
county music that David is doing now is just as vital and like hearing the new music could be, could be on an altar out and, and fit perfectly. How important was it to maintain the new music and, and have like it's like one voice throughout the film, the old and the new, and all sounds like it's one voice? It's a great question. We What we really wanted was for the film to feel like a great David Crosby song. And um, because that's a very unique place, it's a very distinctive thing. You, you, you hear him and you know who he is instantly on the radio or wherever. And, and I think from studying all the music, what we found is there are very few pockets in his musical life where he wasn't operating completely from a passionate and I think, as you just mentioned, um, currently the way music is, it's really hard to make records to get rich. You're, you're, you're kind of doing it because you feel it and you have to do it. It's trying to get rich, you get paid at all. Yeah, <laughs> but now you, and you're out there playing, obviously we see it from the film, that you're, you're out there beating the drum for this music, but making it, you're doing it because you had to. And that's what's similar to his earliest stuff that we're all still listening to. So if we just make it kind of a banquet of feeling and the music that he felt and we feel so much from, then we're on the right track. Mm -hmm. So that was new music and old music, and I know AJ is a big fan of the later period stuff, and it's like completely fluent and all that stuff. And, and I am too. I'm also, because I started a little earlier, I'm, I'm pretty fluent on the earlier stuff. So together, we were able to show him pictures and play him tapes and just say, You had it all covered between the two guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's absolutely great. I want to open up to the audience because I mean, like, what a great opportunity to, to ask questions. Now, now, we know you love the film because you're still sitting here, so if you have any questions, <laughs> not comments, but questions in the hat, what is your question nice and loud? First of all, I just want to say that the Digital Valley performance of the Roots was so powerful. Wasn't it? It was really fun, man. They are so good. I had so much fun. I mean, I played, I, I played a little with Kirk Douglas. He's the, the lead guitar player. I've sat around and flew around with him before. I've always wanted to play with Questlove because he's like a monster drummer. Yeah. Uh, he's, there's two kinds of drummers. There's flash drummers and groove drummers. The only ones you want to hear are the groove drummers. <laughs> Trust me. He's a, an ultimate groove drummer. He doesn't play one note he doesn't have to play. They're all like that, but they're a fabulous band, and it was great fun. You know what's so cool is that Crosby, a testament to his energy, we did a whole day of press. He then goes on the Fallon show, performs, cameras there too, I'm watching them, and then we went and, did, and we had an our New York premiere. I mean, his energy level, I was just <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's pretty amazing. That's what music does to you. I you yeah, have no idea how I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, one right there. Yeah, you. Uh, nice and loud, please. Okay. Well, it's, not, it's just an amazing, amazing life story. Um, and the thing that really struck me was the whole kind of state, you know, um, when you witnessed that. And my question to you, and from your heart, do you think that there's still room for protest music in the world today? That's a great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. Great question. You've been inviting Chance to speak for Scott. <laughs> Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Been there. We had to put it in because it's a big thing in my life. Let me back up a little bit. Our job as singers comes down to us from the troubadours in Middle Ages Europe. They carried the news from town to town. And the town criers, 1230 and all's well, or 1245, and you've elected an imbecile to be president. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's only part of our job. You gotta know that. Because there are people who adopt it as a pose, and that's bullshit. Our job is to take on emotional voyages. Our job is to make you feel things. Uh, and sometimes to be a witness. 
When you see people being shot down, kids being shot down on their own campus, where they're protesting, legally, unarmed, on their own campus, doing something they have a constitutional right to do, take back in your mind to that scene. That wasn't just a couple of shots. It was a couple of hundred shots into a crowd of innocent people doing something legal. Okay, that's a time when we need to be a witness. And it's such a... It was so bad, and it came down from the top. The president said, oh, those people are outside agitators. They're not people. They're different. They're commies. They were students. They were human beings. And they had a right to be where they were. They were doing something legal. Hang on. All we did was ring the bell. What we said in the movie, thank God you put that in there. Every campus in America exploded the next day. All of them. Those signs, those are real. You saw that everywhere. Whole dormitory, nearly going to class, dormitories festooned with things saying, for no more. You know, it was, I wish to God I saw more of it now. We're in a very dark time right now. Our democracy is in trouble right now. No question. People are actually trying to dismantle it. Uh, I wish there was, I've tried, I've been trying to write a song that stirred, that will stir people the way that one stirred this tent. I've asked every friend I have to try and do it. I couldn't have to talk about it on the net. We need a fight song. We need another Ohio. We need another We Shall Overcome. We need another. So, when you, uh, when, when you saw that my thing he cover and you put it in Neil's hand, was it for him to read about it, or were you hoping that he would write about it? You know, I was in a state of shock, man. I think I was crying. Uh, It beats me up. I, I can't help it. It was awful. I mean, Neil felt the same way. He, well, it hit it. It's like somebody had punched him. It was, he's seen this movie, movie. He looks at that stuff and it affects him. And it, it was amazing to watch him write the song right there, right, right now. The best part about it was when I heard him being there and taking the stage and he said, well, I'm, I'm getting on the red eye to New York. This is coming out as soon as it can possibly be. And we put it on the opposite side, we put uh, Find the Cost of Freedom. And the cover was a picture of a part of the Constitution with the four bullet holes in it. Wow. Now, time for one more. And uh, yes, uh, you. Uh, yeah, that's nice loud. Yes. Straight. First of all, I want to thank you for being the fabric of my youth um, and bringing forth so much um, answers just within your music that, you know, we don't really have to ask because you give it to us. And I appreciate that. And my question was going to be where you feel we are today given from then, and you did just answer that. But, sir, I want to thank you for being the fabric of my music. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. One more question. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. There you go. Yeah, you. Nice and loud. Very good question. You have to ask these assholes. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> for the same reason that they skipped Stephen and Neil and 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 Graham and other people, we didn't want to have a series of different people saying, "Well, Crosby's like this," and then another guy saying, "Well, actually, he's more like this," and then third people going, "He's an asshole. He's a saint." We just if there was one more person who should have been in the movie, James Graham would have been good. Because he's a brilliant guy, and I love him very, very much. The, the choice was to, to go about it differently. Otherwise, we would have asked him and a number of other people, 
we kind of thought we could sort of have to include Roger Chris because they may not be around much longer. But uh, Chance will be around. You'll get to know what Chance thinks about me, I promise. <laughs> Fantastic story. Yeah, well, we left out the liver transplant and the time in prison. These are conversations unique to the editing room of this movie. Where do we put the liver transplant? God, we left out the... Because they got great footage, right? You can see they cut me open and then you take your stomach out. It makes sense of the liver. It's really fantastic. I don't know why. There's a lot of life there. <laughs> when you're doing, you know, he probably lived like an epic five lives, and so there's so much of life that he's lived, and we had 90 minutes to tell it, and so we had to... But it's a valid question. Yeah, Chance is, is a big is. thing in my life. you got to know this about Chance. He's the best writing partner I've ever had. Now, this is a guy, for those of you who don't know this story, Chance was given up by his mother for adoption when he was born. You can't track from the parent down, only from the kid up. I knew he existed. I wanted to know where he was. I used to torture myself about it. He's dying, it's no part of this dumpster. I would just really get depressed. But you can't track from the parent down. So then I'm in UCLA dying. Yeah. <laughs> and we get bags because everybody knew where I was. We get Santa Claus size bags of mail, right? And one of them was, hi, we're John and Alan Maven, and we raised your son, James. I got to meet him. Now, here's the magic part. Those meetups go shit almost every time. Somebody brings bad baggage. So, uh, we were good enough for you, huh? Me and Mom. Uh, this time, James came and gave me a great slip and let me earn my way into his life. And we are tight as tick. We love each other. And he's the best writing partner I've ever had. And he's a better musician than I am by far. By far. Was that for a gift? Mm -hmm. he, he makes, he'll make a mistake and fail forward. You know, gets fired from the birds, goes to Florida, meets Johnny Mitchell. And that's, that's how he is. And also, we're saving stuff for part two. <laughs> Here's how you do. Here's the gift that you can give. So now that you've seen the film, and obviously you love it because you know, you're, you're here. So spread the word. And how do you spread the word about movies these days? You go on social media. So go on Twitter. Go on, and I know you're following me on Twitter because you like my tweet about this movie. Uh, you know, but go on Facebook. Go on Instagram. Spread the word in the back. You're still using my space. <laughs> Go for it. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.